thank you for having me. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, I hope you can see the slides. Um, yes, yeah, what, fine, Matthew. Thank you. Yes. Perfect. So, yeah, what I would like to um, yeah, talk about in this presentation about towards robust and trustworthy AI is um, um, first, yeah, outline what are um, yeah, emerging adversarial threats to AI, uh, which are interesting because also they um, tell us something about um, how AI and deep learning um, in particular is working. Um, then I will speak about an open source project that we started um, in the space, the Adversary Robustness Toolbox, and uh, conclude with some, uh, some resources that, that might be of interest to those of you who, who, who would like to dive deeper into this topic. So the uh, premise um, of which we'll start, I think, which many of us believe in is that um, AI has tremendous potential uh, in many business applications and in helping us address uh, important societal, and economic, environmental challenges. Or as Andrew G um, has put it, AI is the new electricity in this famous quote, which to me really means three things. Um, so same like as electricity, AI is with us to stay. Um, same as electricity, it's gonna be everywhere. And same as electricity, we won't even notice when we're using it, but we will notice when we're not using it and when it's, when it's not available. Um, of course, there's yeah, AI is a very broad term and um, for sure there's also been a lot of hype around AI over the past couple of years. Uh, but yeah, I'd like to start with this slide because these, these graphs show the tremendous progress that indeed has been made in the area of artificial intelligence and in machine learning and deep learning in particular. So what this graph on the left shows is how over the past decade, uh, continuously progress has been made in, um, in, in important benchmark tasks. Here, for example, on an image classification task, uh, error rates have gone down um, over the years continuously with really a, yeah, an inflection point in the early 2010s with the introduction of large scale, also called deep neural networks. Uh, and nowadays uh, allowing um, uh, image classification systems to achieve or in some cases even surpass human level uh, accuracies. So on the right hand side, you see a specific example where uh, on an image classification task where um, 22,000 different classes are distinguished, um, um, AI systems often outperform humans because those systems would be able not only to tell you this is an image which shows a bee, uh, but it can tell you exactly what species of bee it is, which most humans can't unless they are trained in these particular areas. Uh, so this is great news. I mean, all this, this progress in AI and deep learning and machine learning. And, and yes, that um, makes then AI applicable and interesting for, for many important applications. But it turns out that um, AI is also surprisingly brittle. And um, I'd like to show a small demonstration of that. So that's an interactive uh, demonstration and you can try it out yourself. Um, so let me switch to the other screen. So what this demo shows, it, it, it shows the working of a state-of-the-art image classifier. So here, for example, you see we, we selected this image here on the top. And then what we see here um, at the bottom is that the image classifier correctly tells us that this image shows a mouse trap, and it's uh, very confident about this prediction, so 100% confidence. Um, now, um, what one can do is one can uh, apply an attack um, which will alter the image. But in a way, so if, if I hover over this, I'm not sure how well this, um, uh, this comes across the, uh, the zoom, but like if you try out the demo yourself, you will see that if you hover off the image, the original and the modified image, they look to human, they look identical. 
there's a small difference, but it's uh, barely noticeable to the human eye. Um, but now the modified image is now misclassified by a state-of-the-art AI model as a scorpion. And we can um, strengthen the attack and make the, um, the AI model um, yeah, as confident about this prediction as, as we want, while the image to us still uh, looks identical. It's, it's a small perturbation applied, but it's, it's, it's just not visible to the human eye. And this, um, we can do this on, on other images as well. So this image, which originally yeah, would be a car wheel, now gets misclassified as a goldfish. Uh, the image of a light bulb, we can get it misclassified as a zebra. The cat becomes an ambulance. And this picture of a cup of coffee is now misclassified as a jellyfish. Uh, so this, this shows the brittleness. So it shows that by making slight imperceptible uh, alterations to the inputs of the machine learning models, we can completely alter and even control the behavior of that, that machine learning model. Let me go back to the slides. Now, so what we've just seen here on, on images in this demonstration, um, it's important to note, so this, this does not only apply to images, it applies to other data types as well. So here's a um, demonstration that we have in our open source project, which shows that you could um, yeah, create something similar on video data. So here, the original video sequence on the left is correctly classified by by a deep learning model as showing a basketball throw. Whereas on the right hand side, um, we perturbed one frame. So not sure if you can see it over, um, over the Zoom, but if you, if you go to this uh, notebook, which is available online, uh, there you would see, uh, better see it. So there's one frame where the, the player picks up the ball uh, with the left hand at the, at the very beginning, where there's um, kind of a little artifact it's only one out of 32 frames to which we applied a small perturbation. Uh, nevertheless, it completely sets off the machine learning model, which now classifies this uh, action as a tennis swing. And examples in, in our toolbox and many other examples have been described in the literature. So the same, you can, uh, you can mount such um, examples on audio data. Uh, you can mount them um, on structured data can even mount them on discrete data. So this is, a, um, this is the rule rather than the exception that machine learning models are brittle and very, very sensitive to such small perturbation of their inputs. So yeah, what is, what is happening here? Uh, I mean, how can that be that these great, powerful AI machine learning, deep learning models that, um, that we all heard about and that um, there was so much hype about that yeah, they behave so foolish, you could say, uh, on, on inputs um, that yeah, a human would process completely differently. And it turns out, and I think that's now the yeah, most widely uh, accepted um, explanation that uh, machine learning models, similar to many of us, they, they're a bit lazy. Uh, so when you train them, and when you um, want them to learn about, um, for example, an image domain, and when you want them to teach how to correctly classify images, they just love to uh, learn and take shortcuts. Um, and here are some examples, so uh, how that manifests itself. So if you show to uh, a state-of-the-art image classifier, the, the image on the left-hand side, um, which shows I've got the texture of an elephant skin, it will classify it as an elephant. So those models are really good at classifying textures. If you show such a model, the image in the middle, the image of a cat, it will recognize this is a cat. But now if you show this image on the right, which is a bit weird, so it's kind of the shape of a cat, but with the texture of a, a elephant skin, what do you think? How, how will the, the model classify this input? Elephant. That's correct. Um, so while I think to, yeah, to the human perception, we're um, yeah, probably 
yeah, paying more attention to the shape and probably would still say, okay, this, this looks like a weird cat, but this is a cat. Um, machine learning models um, yeah, focus much more on the texture because that's just, it's an easier thing to, for them to process because it's not, it does not require them to kind of process all the edges and all the shapes globally in the image and make sense of those. Texture is just the easy thing to, to look at and then say, well, this must be an elephant. Um, here's another example. So um, a state-of-the-art um, image classifier would um, yeah, likely classify this image on the, on the left as a, as a frying pan with the highest confidence. Maybe, con maybe there might be a little confusion. Okay, could this be a walk? But then we know, I mean, a walk has a different shape. Um, but now what happens if you kind of stick kind of a patch, um, like a, a small image of, of noodles into this uh, image? What do you think how, what will the classifier now tells us this, this object is? This one's perhaps a bit, a bit harder, but it, it turns out that if you do that, now you, you will change the, the classifier's belief and it will now likely tell you, oh, this is a walk. And again, this is kind of like a, a cue, uh, you could say, or kind of like a spurious correlation that probably the machine learning model was, I mean, it was trained and it had seen images of frying pans and images of walks. But I think then probably um, walks, uh, the images of walks had been kind of more often been used to prepare noodles. And therefore, there was then the, the shortcut that the machine learning picked up okay, if it's used to process noodles, then must be a walk. Then of course, that's something much easier, kind of a much simpler rule or pattern to learn um, than uh, the shape, which is a, a more complex thing to distinguish. I think what's interesting about um, this example is, and it does not only yeah, reveal how the machine learning model is taking a shortcut, it actually also reveals how yeah, certain cultural biases uh, may come into play here. And this is the last example I'm gonna show. And this is a quite famous uh, example that some computer vision researchers um, synthesized. Yeah, any guesses what? Uh, yeah, most likely a state-of-the-art machine learning model would classify this abstract pattern. Uh, Crossroad, I'm just guessing. Um, Spaghetti. Oh, sorry, no, I gave it away already, but <laughs> so it's likely going to tell you, oh, this must be a school bus. And of course, I mean, that's, I guess, again, it's kind of culturally because like in North America, like school buses yeah, have these um, black and yellow stripes um, or, or patterns. And it's just, yeah, chances are very, very high that probably among all the 1000 classes that the machine learning learned to distinguish uh, from the training data School buses were yeah, among the very few who had this distinct black and yellow patterns. So in that sense, the machine learning model was lazy, but smart as well. And it, it learned that all I need to distinguish a school bus from all the other stuff I've seen in the training set is, I just need to look for these black and yellow uh, patterns and then I, then I can make a confident prediction. And I mean, this is, I, I, of course, yes, it's, it's a bit amusing, it's um, intriguing to, to see those um, properties of machine learning models. And it also is kind of a bit, a bit revealing in terms of what these models really learn. Uh, but then there, yeah, there, there could be then, yeah, more serious consequences if you think about how an adversary could um, exploit these weaknesses. And so in adversarial machine learning, we, look at four different threats and four um, yeah, potential attacks that could be mounted against machine learning models. Uh, so the first type of attack, evasion attack, that's what we've just seen. So where the attacker um, tampers with the inputs uh, to the machine learning models and uh, yeah, completely compromises the, the in integrity of, of the outputs. Um, in a poisoning attack, the attacker um, has access to the training data and can um, insert poisonous training samples and thereby uh, introduce backdoors um, into the machine learning models 
that then could later be uh, exploited. Uh, an inference attack, uh, what's happening there is that the attacker, by querying the machine learning model, uh, is able to uh, infer um, sensitive information from the training set. Uh, so you might think that um, it doesn't matter what was kind of the raw data that I used to train the model. Uh, the trained model itself won't give any, anything away. And, but it turns out that that's not the case. And in certain um, situations, it is possible for the attacker to um, actually extract quite a bit of information about specific uh, training samples that were used in the training set. As one of the consequences, so um, under GDPR, uh, so the data protection regulation, in certain cases, machine learning models themselves have to be treated as personal data uh, because they might, uh, this personal information might have leaked into those models um, and attacker could uh, potentially e extract that. Yeah, the last type of uh, attack, uh, an extraction attack is similar in the sense that, yeah, through querying the model, uh, the attacker might be able to steal a proprietary information about the machine learning model. And yeah, one can easily think about scenarios where these threats can become highly problematic. Uh, for example, in security, um, papers have shown that you can use these techniques um, to mount uh, disappearance attacks uh, against um, CCTV surveillance, for instance. So I think there were a number of demonstrations last year where people showed, so they were able to print t-shirts. And if they were wearing those t-shirts, kind of state-of-the-art um, object recognition systems would not spot them and recognize them as, as humans in a, in a camera image anymore. Uh, autonomous vehicles, so a number of papers have looked at um, uh, their attacks uh, against systems for recognizing traffic signs, for example, uh, or for segmenting images to recognize uh, pedestrians in a scene. And yeah, you can imagine that that could lead to disastrous consequences when, um, when those attacks are mounted in the real world. Uh, cybersecurity, there, um, that's one of the first areas actually where these adversarial um, uh, effects were described. Um, for instance, if, if you think about machine learning models that are being used to, um, to detect malware, um, it's then yeah, very natural kind of for, for a cyber attacker to, um, to change the malware such that it still has uh, its malicious behavior, but that it will also fool the machine learning model and bypass the machine learning model that has been put in place uh, to detect it and neutralize it. And lastly, one can also, of course, imagine that in the, in the financial domain that there's a, a lot that attackers could gain from by evading, um, say, fraud detection systems that, that use machine learning. And of course, fundamentally, un underneath all of this, um, and these, um, yeah, this, this vulnerability of, of machine learning models and these potential um, uh, attack scenarios, um, they carry the risk that they will undermine, kind of generally the society's trust in AI and therefore um, slow down or, or hinder the adoption of, of AI in, in mission critical applications. I, I saw your email. And, um, and such attacks um, are already happening. And particularly in the, so this, in the cybersecurity domain, there are actual reports of um, attackers using these adversarial machine learning techniques to programmatically bypass and evade um, antivirus systems, for instance. And so there exist now a, a number of, kind of official vulnerability notes reporting such weaknesses. Um, and so this becomes, um, in the cybersecurity domain, it is already a problem today uh, that developers uh, need to take into account and need to mitigate. So what we have started on, um, and here in the IBM Research Lab in Dublin, um, around three years ago is, um, is an open source project, uh, the Adversarial Robustness Toolbox, um, which, um, yeah, which is designed to help researchers and developers to, um, uh, to 
you know, to investigate these threats and to uh, investigate and uh, evaluate how sensitive or how robust are their machine learning models um, under such threats. Um, and the toolbox also allows them to apply um, defense mechanisms and uh, assess how effective those, those defenses are. So um, yeah, ART, the toolbox is, it's a Python library. Um, it allows, and on the left hand side, there's, there's a small um, example. So it, it allows then the researchers and developers with a few lines of code to load their uh, machine learning model, um, create a wrapper around it, then perform attacks um, against that model, and then evaluate um, empirically um, yeah, how, uh, how much the model suffers from such attacks. Originally, we started uh, with supporting the most popular deep learning frameworks like um, TensorFlow, MXNet, Keras, PyTorch. Last year, we also added support for um, more conventional machine learning frameworks uh, like XGBoost, uh, scikit-learn, um, etc. Uh, because this is the, these attacks and these phenomena, they are they're not particular to deep learning models. I mean, they apply also to more conventional machine learning models and um, working on structured data. And yeah, on the right hand side of this slide, so this is yeah the the actual release that we did at RSA, so which is uh, one of the biggest security conferences, uh, and then some of the press that that we got afterwards. And um, so what I would like to do next is, um, yeah, show you a bit what's in art uh, and uh, walk through one particular notebook um, that, is, that we have and which I think is quite instructive to um, give you yeah, a bit more insights how kind of these attacks and, and defenses can be applied step by step. Uh, but perhaps before going there, I'll pause here for a minute and, and see if there's any questions to this point. Uh, so actually I have a question here. Mm -hmm. um, so like you saw us an example about, you know, you have an elephant and you have a cat and you, if you kind of merge them, then the classifier is confused that it is an elephant. Um, but like, you know, in that way, when you merge the two images, I think the change on the input image would be quite big, maybe for the, for the classifier. And when you say that we still recognize that it is uh, a cat. So uh, I'm thinking like, you know, the robustness of the machine learning model that you are talking about, is it the robustness of, uh, you are talking about robustness uh, according to the human perceptions, you know? Mm -hmm other than, you know, you have to kind of define what is robustness here, you know. I'm thinking like the image on the right, the change on it might be quite a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I agreed. Um, and, and for sure, so if our goal was to take the image in, in the middle, the image of a cat, and get it misclassified as an elephant, uh, we, could, we, we could achieve the same with much more subtle perturbation which would be imperceptible. Um, I think here, what's really instructive about um, yeah, the set of experiments that, that these authors published is that they show yeah, how we, it's, it's not just this incident, but uh, how generally um, state-of-the-art classifiers rely so much more on textures than on shapes, which um, is yeah, clearly showing that um, yeah, that, that they're much shallower in, in the rep representations that they learn than was initially be believed, like when, when those types of models became popular starting 2012, 2013. Because there back then, I mean, was still hypothesized that, okay, like in representation learning, that you have kind of, kind of really these layer-wise um, processing of information in the image, same to what the human brain does, so where you start, um, recognizing edges and then um, at, at a higher level you start recognizing shapes locally and then at, at a even higher level start recognizing shapes um, kind of globally and globally process all the information the image. But I think these experiments 
show that in many cases, none of this is happening. And it's really staying at a very shallow level where, yeah, if, if the machine learning model is not forced, I mean, either through regularization or through the right type of data, data augmentation to, um, to learn about shapes, it will just yeah, stick with shapes, which are very easy to, um, to process because, yeah, they are just yeah, very local. Thank you. Any other questions before we continue? Yeah. Um, we can probably carry on then. Okay. Good. Then, um, okay, I'll just back to where I left. And then, okay, let me switch the screen again and go to the Go to the library. So this is our um, yeah this is our open source project. So yeah, if you're interested in this topic, yeah, you can all get it from from GitHub. Just clone the repository, um, and think a, a good place. To, uh, to start um, exploring kind of what's an art and look at some examples end to end is the notebooks that we have. Um, and so I'm gonna show in a moment um, a notebook um, uh, working on images. But for instance, what you will see here is this um, example that I showed on one of the slides earlier. So, so this, this notebook here shows um, all the steps end to end um, how to uh, mount and, and replicate uh, the attack uh, that we had um, on uh, on video data um, on and on action recognition. Um, but yeah, the image, the the example that I want to show in a bit more detail now is um, is an example which shows the uh, the basic workflow um, on a on an image classification task. And so what. Uh, what, what we're going to see there is yeah first how to um, how to load a Keras state of the art image classifier and and how to wrap it in art and you will see that's just yeah very few lines of code um, then um, how, how you can apply uh, uh, an attack against that classifier and produce some of these adversarial examples that we showed uh, saw on some of the slides. Also how uh, you can deploy a defense against these attacks. Uh, and at the end, um, if we have time, we can also see how a really smart attacker can um, bypass defenses that, that we put uh, into place. So yeah, in this notebook, um, yeah, first, yeah, there's just prerequisites. I think those are all pretty standard. So, um, yeah, probably many of you working machine learning and, and deep learning um, have worked with Keras, so which is one of the um, most popular deep learning frameworks. Um, and then there's a few art uh, modules that um, that you need to load as well. Um, the images um, that we're going to to work on um, in this uh, example, they're all. Um, yeah, not super high resolution, but reasonably high resolution pictures. So 224 times 224 pixels, three color channels. So that's dimensionality of, of the inputs. Um, and I think here in, in this notebook, we, are, uh, we fixed it to one particular input image. Um, so this is the, the running examples that, that, that we're gonna use. But, but if you clone the repository and open the notebook, you, you can also um, apply the same to, to other images. Um, what we're then doing is, so here we're loading a, a state-of-the-art uh, image classifier. Um, so that's a ResNet 50 architecture and that's kind of, yeah, readily available with Keras. So that ships with, with, a, with a Keras inst uh, installation. Uh, so you have then um, yeah, a, a trained model uh, loaded here. Um, and so what we're doing here is here we're doing just what, what you would do normally with such a Keras model. So you take your input, 
uh, which, uh, which is the, the image, so which is just a, an array of, of pixel values. Um, then um, the Keras model um, expects you to uh, do some pre-processing and do some normalization of the inputs. Uh, but then, and this is the kind of the, yeah, the most important function, then on the Keras model, it has a predict function. And if you call that function, uh, it then um, yeah, gives, the, gives you the, the model's prediction. And if you parse those predictions a bit, then, then you can get the information that on this input, the Keras model predicts, okay, this image shows a unicycle or monocycle uh, with a confidence of 84%, uh, which appears to be a, a correct classification. Um, so what we're doing next is um, um, creating an art wrapper uh, around this Keras model. And this is just uh, two lines of code. Um, so here, this, this is the central piece. So basically we're, we're taking the, the Keras model um, and we're um, creating a art Keras classifier object, um, which is a wrapper around this model, but kind of now abstracts from whether it's Keras or, or any other deep learning framework. Um, what we can verify is that um, when, so the art classifier also has a predict function, which um, gives us the same prediction that we've seen before. Uh, so we can again obtain the prediction that this uh, image shows a unicycle or monocycle um, with the same confidence that we've seen before. Now what's important um, about this art uh, object, about the Keras classifier, it gives us um, access to um, properties of the classifier that can be exploited in an attack. Um, so in particular, what we can do is, uh, what we're showing in this image is, um, um, is basically which pixels in the image of the unicycle uh, are the ones that an attacker should tamper with if they wanted to change the classifier's uh, prediction. Um, and so more formally, uh, we're looking at the, the gradient um, of the classifier's loss with respect to the, the classifier's inputs. And um, if you kind of compare that with, this, with the original, uh, it, yeah, it shows that yeah, this area where indeed the original picture was showing the, the person riding the unicycle, this is where an, an attacker should um, alter pi pixels and, and alter the information in the original image to change the, the classifier's uh, prediction. And yeah, most um, state-of-the-art um, adversarial evasion attacks are really that simple. I mean, that's, that's the only information that they rely on, that they kind of alter picked pixels in such a way um, that it, in, in a direction where it will change the classifier's prediction um, in the way they want. Um, and one such attack that, that we have in art, and I think that's the these days, yeah, one of the most widely used attack to benchmark uh, robustness of machine learning models. It's called projected gradient descent. So what uh, the, this attack uh, works on the classifier uh, that we wrapped. Um, here we're mounting a untargeted attack. I, I will explain in a second what that is. And then there are a few um, other parameters, hyperparameters that this attack uh, expects. And, and of course, those, those are all documented in art. Um, and I, on, on one of my last slides, I also have um, pointers to uh, white papers, et cetera, which um, give a bit more background on, on the workings of, of these attacks and point to the uh, relevant literature. Um, so when we have instantiated this attack in art, we can then call it on, on the input uh, so this is the original image, again, this kind of like a numerical uh, array, and that gives us then an adversarial version of that. And now we do the same thing as before. Uh, we call the, the predict function on this adversarial input. We pass the output that, um, that we get out of the prediction. And what we see now is that the classification has changed indeed. Um, so as before, 
uh, the classifier predicted this image shows a unicycle. It now predicts this image shows a mountain bike or terrain bike off-roader. So this is how, how this category is um, labeled um, with a confidence of 100%. And now you could say, okay, this before the prediction was this is a unicycle. Now uh, we get the prediction this is a mountain bike. It's not too far off, right? I mean, it's not correct, but still it's it still tells us it's a bicycle. And, and this is because what we mounted here, as I said a moment ago, is an untargeted attack. Uh, and that means um, here the attacker's objective is um, to just change the classifier's prediction, not aiming for a particular output for a particular class that the classifier will predict, just alter the prediction. And turns out then if, if we just, as an attacker just want to enforce that, then this is the, um, the prediction that we will obtain. What I think is then much more uh, impressive is to mount a targeted attack. So what we do in a targeted attack, there we will um, perform the, um, uh, the attack and, and we will, there we basically, we pick the class that we want to predict the classifier on the adversarial sample. So there are, on, on this data set, on ImageNet, there are uh, 1,000 different classes that we can pick from. So when you run this notebook, you can make your pick. Uh, I, was, I think in, um, in this example below, I think we will choose this target class, 100, so black swan. Uh, so we will try to misclassify, um, get the, the unicycle picture misclassified as a black swan. But you could pick any of the other uh, 1,000 classes, which I think mostly animals, many different dog breeds. So I think, yeah, this ImageNet data sets, I think trains a model to distinguish 100 different types of dog breeds, which is way more than, than I can distinguish. Um, okay, sorry to scroll to the end. So you see those are all the 1000 uh, classes that, that you could aim for. As I said, yeah, we're gonna aim for, for this this class 100, black swan. So to mount the, the targeted attack, all we need to do, we now need to set the attack to targeted. And now when we call the generate function, example, uh, again, we provided the original input, which we want to be perturbed, but we also provide it with the, the class that we want um, the um, adversarial example to produce. Uh, and when we do that, uh, and again, then we, uh, we apply the classifier to this adversarial example, we parse the output of the classifier, we can see that this um, targeted attack is successful. And indeed, now this image, which um, uh, to us looks like the original image uh, is, but it is now misclassified as, as a black swan, indeed with 100% confidence. As I said, I mean, for us, uh, for human, it, it, it looks like the original image, but we, there is a small difference. And, and this kind of next cell measures that and it plots the difference, kind of pixel per pixel. Um, and we compute some metrics over that. Um, I think this, this metric, for example, the L2 norm means that um, overall 77% of all the pixels were indeed slightly altered. So pretty much all of them, but not all of them. Um, and this one I think is also quite intuitive. So the L infinity norm tells us that, um, that the adversarial image, so no pixel value was changed by more than 2% compared to the original image. And that's why to a human, like, like a 2% change in, a, in the pixel value is, is just typically below the threshold of, of what we can perceive as a difference. Um, I maybe I'll go through the remainder, uh, not in that much detail so that we still have um, time for questions and to wrap up. Um, just to give you a glance. So I think there is, um, there's, there's a number of defenses one, one can imagine that, um, that could be applied. 
in, in order to prevent these adversarial examples from working. And I think a very natural idea is that um, couldn't we um, kind of do some filtering and some signal processing uh, of the input before we feed it to the classifier? Um, and, and this is what we're going to do here. So we're going to uh, do some spatial smoothing or apply a low pass filter uh, essentially to the inputs before we feed them to the classifier, kind of hoping that that will kind of get rid of some of the yeah, adversarial signals and therefore prevent these, these misclassifications. So this is what we're setting up here. So yeah, in art, we have a uh, number of such uh, pre-processing defenses implemented. And yes, one of them is spatial smoothing, which basically uh, looks at the small window of pixels and kind of smooths and, and averages pixel values over those, um, those small neighborhoods. So it's, um, yeah, for those of you who, um, yeah, who, who are working on signal processing, you can, of course, uh, you can interpret this as a, as a low pass filter. Um, and so it turns out if we do that, so if we um, apply the spatial smoothing, um, I th two things we want to check. And we want to check that it doesn't hurt us on the original inputs. Second thing we want to check is that indeed it is effective, uh, effective on the adversarial inputs. Uh, so we apply the spatial smoothing to both the original input and the adversarial example that we just generated. And when we do that, and then we, uh, we apply the classifier to these uh, defended inputs and, and parse the predictions, uh, it turns out that, yes, at first glance, that, that seems to be effective. Um, so first of all, the original sample, even if it kind of undergoes kind of this, this low pass filtering, there's still enough information that the classifier can correctly classify it. And also now, um, when we take the adversarial example and we do the low pass filtering of it, it indeed it get, gets rid of the, the adversarial signal and the classifier will now not mistake it as a black swan anymore, but produce the, the correct uh, classification as a, as a unicycle. So this is, seems to be good news that, okay, there's things we can do to defend against these adversarial um, examples. Uh, thing to, to be aware of is if the attacker is aware that we put this defense in place, they can bypass it and they can uh, create adversarial examples that kind of survive this um, signal processing and, and this pre-processing. Um, and we can also demonstrate that in art. Uh, so what you do there is that, um, again, you, so you wrap your model in a Keras classifier and you apply um, here uh, the pre-processing defense. Um, and so if you do that, then first of all, kind of it, it will kind of reproduce the behavior that we just saw. Um, namely, when, when you give now the, the adversarial example that we had created before, uh, when you apply the classifier to it, um, because of the pre-processing defense that we put in place here, um, the classifier will, um, will um, get rid of the adversarial perturbation and correctly classify the image. But now this, of course, this, this adversary example that created before, there the attacker was oblivious to the fact that, that the classifier was going to use this defense. But now um, if the attacker um, takes this into account and if the attacker uh, in the, during the attack um, um, yeah, accounts for the fact that later on the, the inputs are going to be um, filtered, um, then the attacker is able indeed to uh, produce an adversarial example, which will bypass this pre-processing defense. And yeah, unfortunately that is kind of the, the state of the art today that most of these pre-processing defenses, while um, initially they, they seem to be promising and um, they seem to be able to filter out um, adversarial perturbations, at the end of the day, they are not considered to be valid defenses because uh, an adaptive attacker, an attacker who knows about those defenses, 
uh, will be able to neutralize them. Okay, then I'll then go back to the slides and uh, wrap up the presentation. And so this this is um, uh, my last slide. So yeah, I want to conclude with some some resources. So if you're interested in this topic, then yeah, I strongly yeah encourage you to um, yeah check out the the open source project. So clone the the GitHub repository. Um, yeah, you will find say documentation of um, the wrappers that I showed you in the notebook um, of the attacks. Uh, of the defenses, um, we have. If you want to, um, yeah, engage further, we have a public Slack channel uh, that you can join. If you yeah, want to discuss findings or ask general questions, uh, etc., uh, here's also a link to the demo um, that I showed earlier, the interactive demo that I showed at the beginning. Um, a link to a blog um, that we published last year, which talks in particular about the support that we have for conventional machine learning models, uh, a white paper, uh, which is on archive, um, which provides more background on um, the workings uh, of some of the attacks, and then which also has yeah, references to a lot of the uh, original research literature in this area. Then there's also a tutorial uh, that we gave uh, at, a, at ECML PKDD two years ago when it was in, in Dublin. Uh, on this topic, because that's two years ago, and the the field has is, is evolving fast. But I think kind of the the basics and the fundamentals um, in in this tutorial are still valid. And then broadly, so I mentioned earlier that of course, like this, um, yeah, these questions around robustness, they are related. Um, yeah, they could could affect um, overall um, society's trust in AI models. And that's also one thing that might be of interest to some of you, kind of like IBM Research's broader view on trusted AI. And uh, so besides robustness, other topics like fairness or explainability, uh, where there's also a lot of work and actually also open source projects um, that, that were initiated by, initiated by, by IBM Research. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you for your uh, attention. Um,